Thanks for coming this morning uh, to the presentation about the new tax act, which I actually call the tax act of smoke and mirrors, because it's not exactly what you think it's going to be. They've promoted a lot of the really good parts saying, oh, this is really good. And, and you know, you're going to get a whole lot of money back. You're going to find out that part of that is true. Part of it is not quite so true. So bear with me, of course, there's a lot in, this new tax, in these new tax laws. So some of it is going to be for younger people, some of it's going to be for older people, some of it's going to be for business people. So if you're not real excited and you're falling asleep in the first 10 minutes and you wanna leave, I ask that you don't, because we're probably going to get to a part or two that um, will apply to you and that you'll be glad that you came in. Those heard. of you who know me better uh, than some of the others, you know that if I'm at the office or if I'm at home and, and you know, I'm about to do something, they'll go, you know, Ron, you, you really shouldn't be doing that. You're, you're getting too old for that stuff. My, my normal standard reply is, Bull, I can do anything I want. I'm Superman. So, <laughs> Gia found this neat little uh, cartoon that shows Superman getting buried by the IRS codes. Um, Bull, I'm Superman. I can even beat them. <laughs> so, let's get into what you came to hear today. If you want to see the law for itself, we gave you all a little handout and it's on there so you don't have to write this down, but that's the actual website that you go to. Then there's several hundred, several hundred pages of lawyerese that is extremely difficult to actually read and try and figure out what they're actually trying to tell you through all of that. And of course, that's why you come to me or to your other accountants, not all of you know me, of course. Um, because we're the ones who then figure it out and decipher it and bring it back into English so that we can all use it and use it to our best advantage whenever possible. But if you really want to bore yourself, or you're having trouble going to sleep some night, go to that website, start reading that. That should do the trick for you. Okay, so let's get right into what is happening with this new law. As you know, they said that they're going to, originally, they were going to bring it down to 15% and they were only going to have three brackets because they were going to make this simpler. I've been doing this for 30 years. Every time they make something simpler, it makes me more money. Every single time. So they're doing it again. It's just like every other time that they've done it. So anyway, they said they were going to bring it down to three brackets. As you can see, that did not happen. There are still seven brackets. The very first bracket, the 10% bracket, did not change at all. So your income, taxable income, up to the $19,050 will be taxed at 10%. It's after that that the changes start to occur. So the next bracket is from the $19,000 to the $77,000. A dollar, and that used to be your 15% tax bracket, and now that's going to be a 12% tax bracket. But don't get too excited because you're going to see what they give it, they also take it away here in a few minutes. So the next tax bracket after that is the 77 to 165, um, and that used to be your 25% tax bracket, and that's down to 22% now. I'm not going to go through the other four levels because those top three levels actually cover 90% of our entire population here in the United States. There's very few people who fall into those higher brackets after that. So here's the math. Here's how it would actually work um, just on a very standard case. We're going to show you a couple of them here. But here's how it's working out. So what I did is I looked up the Colorado average household income and for 2016 it was, or 2015, it was the $66,596. So I'm going to use that for the example. And we're going to say that it's a married couple with no children and they're taking the standard deduction. Now Congress has told you that the average household is going to save about $1,100 a year. Okay, about 1180 I think they said something along those lines. So here's how it's gonna look. So we're using the income of the 66,596. The standard deduction will jump, just like they said, from the 12,600 to the 24,000. That's the good news, that they wanted everybody to know and they talked about it for months and months and months. What they didn't tell us to the very end was what we traded off for that. And so everybody was thinking, oh good, I'm going to get an extra $12,000 in every year and not have to pay taxes on it. Not exactly true, because what they did is they took away the personal exemptions. 
So for 2017, we still have the $8,000 of personal exemptions. For 2018, that will not be true. So in reality, there's only about $3,500 difference of money that you won't have to pay taxes on. So that's the taxable income, 45 versus 42 and a half. Um, there's the 10% tax, there's the 15 and the 12% tax, there's the total tax for the year. So we have in 2017 about $5,900, in 2018 that'll be about $4,700, which is going to give us about $1,200 difference. So pretty close to what they said, it's gonna be about $1,100 per household. But let's use a more reliable example, it's something that, that's more typical of what's going on, especially here in Colorado. So I changed it and, and we took it to a married couple with two children, about $18,000 in itemized deductions, that's home mortgage interest, property taxes, charitable deductions and that, um, and a household income of closer to 80,000. Let's see how this works out. So once again, now we have itemized deductions of 18,000 and the standard deduction is still only 24,000. So as you can see, the more you have in itemized deductions, the less this is going to help you in this case. Um, but they are saying they're gonna simplify it. And this is how they're saying they're gonna simplify it. They're trying to force everybody into this standard deduction. You'll see a little later on how that's not necessarily going to work for um, some people. The exemptions this time we had 16,000 because the two parents, the two kids. So uh, 4,050 times four gives you the $16,000. And we do not get that over on the right hand side. That doesn't exist anymore. And so now we have our taxable income of 45,000 versus 54,000, right? And so now when we bring in the 10%, it stays the same, of course, but look what happens with the 15 and the 12. The 12 is less than 15, but the 12 is being charged on quite a bit more money. And so it actually comes out with a higher tax than what we had in 2017. So this is why they had to start coming in with the uh, child tax credits. They had to raise that so that the people would still actually get a little bit more money instead of less money. So the total tax at this point in time under the 2018 without the child care taxes actually would have been more even though you have a lower percentage rate. So now we throw on the child tax credits, they have doubled them, huge, huge. Um, that's one of the biggest changes in the entire tax law. So we went from $1,000 per child to $2,000 per child if you have that much in actual taxes. If you don't, you'll only get about $1,600 per kid because some of that's refundable as a cash refund, some of it is not. So in the end here, there's the final tax, 39 versus 23. In this particular case, they'd save about $1,500 uh, $1, a year. So that works out. You're gonna make somewhere between about $100 and $130 more a month under the new tax law. How many people are really happy about that and are gonna change their lifestyles because they're making, they have an extra $100 a month? Well, it gets worse. You're not gonna to get to keep the $100 a month. One of the things that they said is going to, ha one of the other parts of the law is that they're taking away the mandatory um, health insurance. And so the insurance companies have already said, oh boy, am I gonna pick on them here in a little bit, but they've already said they're probably gonna raise prices an extra 10% because of that. Well, since most people's health insurance for a family right now probably runs anywhere between $1,222 and $2,200 a month, you take 10% of that, what's that? Let's call it 150 a month. The 150 a month they just saved you that you were getting in your paycheck, it's gone. They gave it to the corporations. The more you have or had in itemized deductions, the less this new tax law is going to help you because that 24,000 stays steady, but it's gonna eat up some of what you used to be able to take off. However, the more children you have, the more it's going to help you. So the true moral of the story is, everybody go have more kids, <laughs> right? No? <laughs> I've raised a few myself. Um, <laughs> they cost a lot more than $2,000 a year. <laughs> So maybe that's not, not, not your best tactic uh, for, for uh, saving on taxes. Okay, so to move on. Most, but not all. But most small businesses are going to come out ahead on this in that they're offering them a 20% deduction right off the top of their income. So they'll get to, whatever their income was, they get to take 20% and 
they get to not have to pay taxes on that. They'll still pay self-employment taxes, but not the income taxes. However, I said most, but not all. Unfortunately, I'm one of the not alls. Um, it does not apply to lawyers, to um, doctors, or to accountants. Everybody knows what I do in this room, right? For a living? <laughs> so um, they decided that if your main product or service is knowledge that's in your head, that's not eligible for the 20% deduction. Don't ask me why. So this brings up an interesting case, actually, because several years ago, the IRS and I were having this back and forth argument. They wanted me to split my business into the tax business and the financial business. And I said, no, the name of the business is Verostic Tax and Financial. It's one business. I'm not going to try and figure out how much paper goes here and how much goes here and how much phone goes here and how much phone goes here. And I wouldn't do it. I eventually won. They finally gave up. However, now that they changed the law, I'm going to argue back the other way. Since I can't get on the accounting side, and that's only about half my income, but I can on the financial side, I now own two businesses, <laughs> as far as that's concerned, because I could get my 20% deduction over here, but I can't get it over here. So I'm going to make sure most of the costs and everything, everything's going to stay over here, and I'm at least going to get part of it. So now, all of a sudden, I'm going to agree with what the IRS liked several years ago, now they're going to probably try and tell me, no, 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 it's all one business. I'm going to go, no, 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 it just became two. You guys did it. So um, that's part of the whole reason for this presentation today is just so that all of you, and hopefully everybody eventually knows um, and is aware that there are ways around these rules. There always are. The lawyers in Washington, they think they're pretty smart. They are pretty smart, and they always write the rules, and then it gives it to us accountants, and then we show them how it's really going to work in the end. And just so that you know, because not all of you know me, uh, but this is not a promotion to have you guys become new clients if you're not already clients. Uh, actually, I can't even do that anymore. I, we're full. We're not taking on any new clients. So don't think we're going to pressure you after the, at the end to become new clients. We're, we're absolutely as full as we can be. But I like helping people. If I can't help them by preparing their taxes anymore, I said the next best thing is at least go out and educate them so that they can use this information with their other accountants or their box software or whatever it is that they use. Okay, enough for that commercial. Um, it does apply to rental income on the other hand because the law states that any business activity that's bringing in income and considered as a pass-through will be eligible for this 20% reduction of income. So if you have income properties and you're showing a profit, on the first 20% of that profit, you won't have to pay taxes on that. And that is going to lead us to, so what kind of business do you want to start someday? You know, you might want to be looking at, at owning rental properties because it just became quite a bit more lucrative. Um, there are some other minor changes that work back against it a little bit, such as depreciation. They've extended a little bit further. It used to be 27 and a half years for a residential property, now it's 30. But th that's minor. It's still a pretty big tax break to get this um, extra 20% that you don't have to pay taxes on. They did all of this um, to make it look like they care as much about the small businesses as they do about the large corporations. Of course, that's not quite true. Um, because the small businesses aren't getting anywhere near the break the large corporations are. You're going to see that in just a second here. But they tried to make it at least look that way. But it only goes up to a limit. Like they said inside the law that you'll never have to pay more than 25% on your business income, but only up to a certain point. It's like around $165,000. Well, I already told you, only 10% of the population ever makes more than that anyway. So how many small businesses are going to get an effect from that? Very few, if any. Um, they also, and the corporations are down to 21%. So 25, 21, they're still not giving the small businesses anywhere near the break they're giving the big businesses. They also said, uh, well, now you could write out, you could buy almost as much machinery as you want, up to, you know, a um, million dollars or better. And um, whereas it used to be 100,000. And so they see this, they're promoting it as another one of the great big giveaways that they're giving. But I was reading one article, and I liked the way the guy put it. He goes, it's kind of like giving some, offering ice cream to somebody who's lactose intolerant. You know they're not going to take it. You know they're not going to use it. So it just looks good. It doesn't actually do anything for anybody. A lot of this tax law is kind of written that way. They, they gave us that 
things that we're never going to use that will have a hard time taking a benefit from it, especially the small businesses. So it is precisely because of the way they write the laws that we find the loopholes. <laughs> Lots of times we'll find two laws that work against each other. Another one of those little rules that don't apply to certain groups of people is if you have an office, you can't also have a home office, right? And so what we found, but on the other hand, there is such a thing called a self-rental. And so what we did for people who can't actually deduct expenses for a home office, what we did is we just started telling people, okay, rent yourself one of the rooms out of your house to your business. Because there is a law that says if you own a business and you also own property, you can rent part or all of that property to yourself and you get to write it off. Now you do get to you have to claim it back as income over here. So that part kind of evens out, but now we get to take the deductions that we weren't allowed to take before, such as part of your utilities and part of your insurance and part of your taxes and all that. So we use self-rental quite a bit. We're going to be using it a whole lot more with this new law. You're going to see why here in just a few minutes. Um, but that's just one example of that's what we do is we look at the entire law, we look at different parts of the law, and we find out that many times they almost contradict each other, and we'll use them against each other, but to our benefits, and it's of course totally legal and justified. That's what they get for writing it that way. They, they do love their, their corporate sponsors. Now the corporations, they're dropping from a 35% tax rate all the way down to a 21% tax rate, which is huge, that's a 40% um, uh, deduction, basically, yeah, they're paying 40% less, which is lots of money. I mean, we're talking billions of dollars. I call it illogical logic. The reason that they say they're doing this is to spur the economy on. But as you all know, we're at full, on, we're at full employment right now. Anything that's less than 4.6% for the last 100 years was considered full employment. Well, we're already there. People are actually having trouble finding workers now. And they called this act the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Why do we need a Jobs Act if we're at full employment? It doesn't make sense. But they're going, well, it's okay. We're going to give all these tax breaks, and then we're going to make the money back because the economy is going to be better, and so people will pay more in taxes. But if they go back and look and just learn from history, that didn't work the first time around. It's not going to work the second time around. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, we had Reaganomics, and that was called trickle-down economy, right? And what happened right after that? We had wild, out-of-control inflation. The same thing's going to happen all over again, so just start planning on it. Because what happens is, if you're at full employment, but you're creating more jobs, what happens? Well, the people who really need to fill those jobs, they're going to offer more money to get the people to come in and fill those jobs. But now the people are losing the people, they're going to offer more money to try and get the people to stay there. And so it really, um, our buying power is not going to change. Will the dollar's amount go up? Yes, they most certainly will. But your buying power won't change at all. Then they're also thinking the corporations are going to put all this extra money back into the economy. Let me give you an example of how this has worked so far. I'm going to pick on United Healthcare, being that you all know I just love health insurance companies to start with. Um, and so in 2016, their total profit was $11 billion. And the taxes that they paid were $4 billion, and their net profit, therefore, after taxes was $7 billion. Okay, so in 2018, they're going to pay $2.4 billion less in taxes, um, or they're going to pay 2.4, which is $1.7 billion in savings. Now, in Colorado, the average income, I showed you the average household income for 2016 was $66,000, right? Okay, so if we take this back to 2009, the average income was $55,000. So if you look at that, that works out to about 1.8% difference, or an 8% difference all the way from 2009 to 2016. In the last two years, the profit of United Healthcare has gone up by 7%. Income took six years to go up 8%, United Healthcare managed to do almost the exact same thing in two years. So what do you think the chances are they're going to be passing on these, this extra income that they're making on down to us? And they've already said they're going to raise healthcare prices again by an extra 10%, even this year's savings. 
what were our increases this year? It was over 30% average increases uh, for health insurance, and yet you got a whole hundred dollars a month extra from the government to help pay for that. Um, their profit so it rose by 7% in two years. So their stock went from 2009 to 2016, went from $36 a share paying three cent dividend to $164 a share paying a 75% dividend every quarter. That's a 2,500% increase in their dividend rate. But we only, our, raise, our incomes only went up 8%. So you can imagine from there where a lot of these profits are going to go. You may see that they've had a few articles out here lately. All these companies are, oh yeah, this is great. We're going to help and share this with the people. So they're giving out hundred that, or they're giving out thousand dollar bonuses, one time, one year bonus of a thousand dollars. So take Comcast for instance. Comcast last year made sixteen billion dollars. Taxes were five point or were five billion dollars. Um, under the new law it will only be 3.36 so they're going to walk away with 1.6 billion dollars in extra reserves. They're one of the companies, now they're a big company, they're a big national company, they own NBC and they're a big company. So they have a hundred thousand employees, they're going to give a thousand dollar bonus to each of those hundred thousand employees. So that works out to a hundred million dollars. They're saving 1.6 billion they're sharing 100 million. What's happening to the other 1.5 billion? The government thinks they're gonna share all this. They're gonna share a 16th of it. The rest of it's gonna go back to stockholders. So if you don't own stocks, own stocks that pay dividends, because dividends are gonna go up here, for sure, for a couple of years. Now the companies, the reason why they're doing that, they're saying, is they don't trust the government much more than we do. And so they're not sure that these laws are going to stick and that they're going to still have these savings every year. And so they don't want to make commitments and actually give uh, wage increases. But when you stop and think about $1,000 a year, that's about 50 cents an hour raise that they'd have to give the people and just maintain it throughout the years. They won't even do that at the moment. So I don't think it's going to stimulate the economy anywhere near what the government's thinking it's going to. So moving on, the last little bit of good news with the emphasis on little here. If you're... <laughs> If you're a teacher, there's always been this, stan this standard deduction that you could take around the front of the page of the 1040, and it was $250 a year. They have doubled that up to $500 a year, and that's good. That, that's a really fair deduction. Most teachers do spend anywhere between $50 and $100 a month supplying their, um, their classrooms with supplies that they need that the school district either doesn't give them or the, you know, the kids don't bring and stuff. And so it's a good deduction, and I'm glad to see that they did that one. Um, not as many individuals will be hit with the AMT. The AMT is the alternative minimum tax, is what that stands for. And lots of people, unfortunately, get hit with this. Like, they'll own maybe a duplex. Uh, this one particular lady, I know for sure, owned a duplex. When she finally sold it for about, this was a few years back, so it was about $250,000, $300,000. Um, because she never had much of other income, she got hit with the stupid AMT, which was 26%. That was big, because they looked at it and they go, you made a quarter million dollars this year, you're rich. So we're gonna hit you with this alternative minimum tax. Well, she was rich for one year. You know, it's not like she was rich, rich. And so it's been an unfair tax. They never should have written it in the first place back in 1987. They've been talking about getting rid of it ever since 1987. And that's all they ever really accomplish is they talk a lot and they don't get much done. So what they did is they changed them. They said, well, now fewer people get hit with it, but they're still gonna get hit with it. On the other hand, no corporations will be hit with it. They totally got rid of it for corporations, but not for the individuals. Corporations hardly ever pay it anyway. And then the penalty for not paying for, uh, for not having health insurance will disappear which is good news and bad news. The good news is those of you who don't want to have health insurance or can't afford the health insurance even with the extra help and stuff, you're not going to get penalized for not having it. The bad news is the co insurance companies have already said because that's happening, they're going to raise prices an extra 10% next year. And it's the only part of the law that does not take effect till 2019 for some reason. So for 2018, if you don't have health insurance, you'll still be paying that penalty. Okay. So, what are we losing? 
we're not going to lose anything, right? They're just going to be really nice to us. Some of these don't, um, we don't use them often, but when we do, they're big ones. They're really big ones. So, for instance, there'll be no more casualty or theft losses except for a uh, declared federal disaster. So if you have a big storm, we have a big storm here in Longmont, lightning hits your tree, the tree hits the house, hits the fence, hits the car, you're out twenty, thirty thousand dollars Insurance covers maybe half of it or part of it. You used to be able to deduct the rest of it that exceeded your income by 10%. And so many times we're talking big deductions, twenty, thirty thousand dollar deductions. That won't work anymore, unless it was a federal de federally declared disaster. What about the Madoff case? There's people who, have lo who lost millions of dollars. We were able to convince uh, the IRS through their own rules, because that was a theft, that we were able to take the losses all in one shot, or at least within a matter of a couple of years. They wanted everybody to take it as capital gains losses, which are limited to $3,000 a year. Do you know how many years it takes to recover a million dollars or $3,000 a year? Longer than most of us are going to live. So by having it as a theft loss, we were able to wipe those out normally in two or three years and people at least got some tax break off of that. That would not have been declared a federal disaster, therefore that would not have happened. So if something like that happens again, tough, the people are just out of luck. So that's the big one um, that they're losing. Uh, no more moving deductions. So it used to be they figured if you're moving for a job from one location to another location, you'd get to deduct your moving expenses because you're going to make more money and you'll pay more taxes. So they were okay with that. Anymore, they're not. The only exception they made is for the military, which is slightly ironic because a lot of the military, um, a big portion of their move is covered by the government anyway, and then there's the other portion. I'm glad they're leaving it for the military. They certainly deserve um, to have this break, but I think everybody should have deserved to have it, but it's just another one of those little things that they're taking away. So they gave us that big, supposedly extra $12,000 of standard deduction, but as you can see, little by little, they're taking away um, from different spots. No more employee transportation benefits. This one actually kind of irks me. It's funny, because I'm usually not that much of a bleeding heart liberal, but this, <laughs> I'm usually not, you know. Um, this is good for the ecology because this was promoting people to take mass transportation. The, the companies would pay part of your bill, at least for you, if you would take the bus, if you would take the railway, or some companies even paid if you would take your bicycle. They're getting rid of all of that. So now we're going to see how many companies are really uh, socially responsible. They, were, were they doing it just for the tax break or were they doing it because they're socially responsible? I think we're going to lose part of that, which is going to put more cars on the road, which is going to put more pollution in the air, which is going to cause all kinds of new problems. I don't think they thought this one through very carefully. It wasn't that big of a deduction to start with, and it was certainly good um, socio social economically. Um, so that one, that one bugs me, uh, which is weird. but. <laughs> Uh, no more entertainment expenses for large or small businesses. So they always had something that was called meals and entertainment. Well, we'll get to keep the meals, but no more entertainment. I'm a golfer. I like playing golf. Um, I'm not any good at it, but I still like it. <laughs> it's kind of fun to do. And a lot of business takes place on golf courses, but also takes place in dinner theaters and baseball games and uh, cruises and, and all kinds of things. And companies would spend money even more money than they had to just because they'd rather give it to their employees than give it to the government is basically what was happening. Well, back to the golf courses for a second, they've already been having trouble for the last few years. There's fewer and fewer golfers, and so they're having trouble making ends meet. Well, if you take this one away, it's going to hurt them even more because a lot of golfing takes place on corporate dollars or small business dollars. Um, with the tournaments and stuff that, w that we have. It, it's just, it's huge. So the meals are going to go on. But once again, thank God for the accountants. <laughs> because they said they're taking away the entertainment expense. They did not take away gifting. So what we'll probably end up doing is, I want to take Jim golfing with me. I'm going to buy Jim a $25 gift certificate at the golf shop, give him the gift, and then say, when do we want to go use that? 
right? <laughs> so there's always loopholes. There's ways around this, and, and we're going to find them for you as it, time moves on. Okay. Um, there are no more miscellaneous deductions, and this is huge. This is really, really big for some of the people. This means no more legal fees. So you used to be able to deduct legal fees if it was related to income or the producing of income. Uh, no more of that. And those usually ran thousands of dollars. There's several thousand dollars. No more money management fees. Many of you um, have man money managed accounts usually charging one, one and a half percent. A lot of you are paying anywhere between five and $10,000 a year in management fees. Uh, we used to be able to, to deduct those. No more, that's all gone. No more home office deduction unless you're self-employed. Now this is big. There's um, a lot of people who work from home. They work for a regular company and they get a regular W-2, but they still work from home. And so they were able to deduct, you know, the home office expenses. And that was good, but not anymore, that's going away. No more business employee expenses. Home office was one part of that. The other ones are, I have one guy, he travels about 50 to 60,000 miles a year because he covers three states, he's a, a salesperson. His write-off was $30,000 a year. No more, it's gone. Mechanics who buy tools, a lot of mechanics are out there and they'll buy, you know, they're employed by one of the big dealerships and so, but they buy their own tools. And a lot of times we're talking four, six, eight thousand dollars a year. No more. It's all gone. However, we do have a loophole for it. I'll tell you that one here in just a minute. We already found that one. It doesn't take us long to find these loopholes. Um, other no mores. No more mortgage interest on second mortgages. So everybody's been doing second mortgages to buy a new car or whatever the case may be because then they got to deduct the interest. So they took that away. Are you seeing a pattern here? They gave you that $24,000 deduction, but now they're almost making sure you're gonna use that $24,000 standard deduction by taking away all the things that used to take you over and above that $24,000. So there's gonna be quite a few people who actually end up paying um, more taxes. No more uh, mortgage interest on the amount of a loan over $750,000. Now I know all of you will have million dollar homes. The, not quite true, but so this isn't gonna affect a whole lot of people, but you gotta remember bracket creep. This is what happens every time Congress passes a new tax law. If you go all the way back to 1914, I'm not quite that old, but anyway, if you go back to 1914, when they first came up with an income tax, everybody was in favor of, oh yeah, this is good because it's only going to affect 2% of the population. It's only going to affect the rich. By 1919, five years later, it was affecting over 25% of the population. By 1930, it was over 60% of the population. And by 1950, it was over 80% of the population because they never changed the numbers. Bracket creep happens. When they first started taxing Social Security income, um, 1980 something, don't remember that one. Um, most people didn't care too much because it was only going to affect two to 5% of the population. That was true in the first year. Now over 60% of the people who get Social Security pay taxes on their Social Security income because of bracket creep. A few years ago, our houses were, what, $250,000? You could buy a pretty nice house for two fifty, dollars right? Now they're four hundred, dollars right? The average price for a house here in Colorado now is a little over $400,000. Five years from now, seven fifty dollars is not going to be out of reach anymore. That's going to be the average price. All of a sudden, there's going to be people who aren't going to be able to deduct a good portion of the mortgage interest because of bracket creep. No tax deduction after the first $10,000. That won't apply to too many of us in Colorado. Some people it will. So this is your state income taxes, it's your property taxes, it's your sales taxes, it's your personal property taxes such as uh, the car ownership taxes and all of that. So a lot of us in Colorado, we don't hit that number. There's a few people who make a lot of money and so their income taxes alone will be you know five to six thousand dollars and their property taxes if they live in a real nice house could be up around five or six thousand so it might affect a few people um, but right now it won't affect Colorado too much the states like New York uh, California Illinois where they have really high property taxes and real high income taxes to boot now those people are taking a great big hit huge hit 
uh, by losing this one. This, there's several states, I think last I heard is there's seven states that are actually suing the federal government trying to reverse that part of the law. Um, so tactics, statutory employee status. This is something that's been around for a long time but hasn't been used much. If you look on W-2 when you get paid, at the end of the year you get your W-2s, there's three boxes, kind of on the left-hand side, don't remember what box number it is for sure, probably about six or seven, no, it's gotta be like six. And it'll say employee, statutory employee, or third-party sick pay. It's gonna be one of those three. You hardly ever see statutory employee. What that is, it's for companies that have, like insurance companies that have captive agents. So if we take somebody like a Metropolitan Life and their agents only work for Metropolitan Life, then they do this trade-off with them. They'll pay them on W-2 and they'll pay half of their social security, just like if they were a regular employee, but they're an independent business person. So what statutory employee means is you're going to get your income reported on W-2, they're gonna pay half your social security and so that goes up on line seven, but because it's statutory employee, you get to fill out what's called a Schedule C, and you get to take all your business expenses and deduct those. So you have no income on the Schedule C, because that's with the W-2, but they allow you to do the Schedule C to take all your expenses. Like I said, this hasn't been used very much. Now we're gonna use it a whole lot. We need to get people, like my daughter. I said she works from home. She works for a company. She gets a W-2. Um, that's, but now she can't have home office expenses. She can't have, take her mileage anymore because they knocked out all the miscellaneous deductions. So if we convince the companies to reclassify her as a statutory employee, she'll still get her income, they'll still pay half of the social security and all that, but now she'll get to do a Schedule C and we'll still get to take all those expenses that we used to take in a different place. Um, so it's just a matter of manipulating things again. The guy who, who travels 50, 60,000 miles a year, we're going to get his employers to list him as a statutory employee instead so we could turn around and still get those expenses back. So like I said, the government thinks that they're going to outsmart us and, and find these ways and get more money out of us. And then we think, uh, no, you're not. We'll just use a different part of your rules and bring it in a different way. So that's where a lot of that's going to happen. The SEF rentals, once again, um, now, because we're a statutory employee, now we can take our business expenses under a business. One of the things we want to do is rent our part of our home to ourselves, our home office back to ourselves. Why would we want to do that? Well, for one, we want the deduction, even though we got to claim part of it back as income. But that part that we get to claim back as income, what did we say about rentals before? 20% of the income you don't have to pay taxes on. So now you charge your own business $6,000, and then when you bring it back over here on the income, we only have to pay taxes on 4,800 4, of that 6,000. So it's just a matter of moving it from here to here, putting it in the right place, using up the rules, and um, that's how you come out ahead on this. So, the last absolutely bonkers, because I've been preaching this for, since 2010. They passed the law that said, if you're in the 15% tax bracket and you have capital gains, your capital gains tax rate is 0%. Everybody should be taking advantage of this. I've been preaching this now for six, seven, eight years um, because people aren't taking advantage of it and they should. So in other words, let's say you have $50,000 of income and we know the 15% the tax bracket ended at 75, 76,000. So that meant there was this $20,000 that you could have brought in that much capital gains, $20,000 worth of capital gains and paid absolutely zero dollars taxes on it. My record for doing this with somebody is actually $37,000. We brought in $37,000 and paid zero dollars in taxes on that. It can be done. We, I do it every year, but I ought to be doing a whole lot more. So people go, well, it doesn't matter. I don't want it. And they're afraid because they've heard the other rule. They go, well, you can't sell a stock and then rebuy it within 31 days. Yes, you can. You can't take a loss if you do that. There's no rule that says you can't do it so long as you took a gain. So let's say you have a stock that you bought for $10 several years ago, and now it's worth $30 a share. And you your taxable income is 50 or 60,000. So you have this big gap of 15 to 20,000 dollars. 
go ahead and sell the stock. You love the stock because your father gave it to you. You love the stock because you just love that company, whatever the case. I don't care, buy it back the next day. But sell it today, grab the gain, pay zero dollars in taxes, and then buy it back tomorrow. If you bought, sold it tonight and bought it back tomorrow morning, it's gonna be about the same price, right? Unless something drastic, really drastic happened, but that's not the case most of the time. So if you're sitting on gains, especially in the stock market, sell them every now and then if you're in that 15% tax bracket. And that tax bracket just got pretty big. Now it's 12% tax bracket, but do it. Because if you don't do that, 10, 15 years from now, now it's a $50 stock. Now we have a $40 per share gain, right? If you had taken out the first 20, we're back to 20 again, and we might be able to, get to use the rule again. So you're definitely gonna save taxes, and you might get out of it altogether tax-free. So if you're sitting on stocks, everybody looks, should I sell my losers, you know, at the end of the year and, and take my tax write-off? Should be thinking, can I sell my winners, not pay any taxes, buy them back tomorrow and still be just as happy and have gotten all that money in tax-free? So pay attention to that one um, when the opportunity arises. So those of you, as you know, most of you know, I've written a book, it's called Financially Intact, it was the first slide, it'll be the last slide. It's for sale in the lobby. Do not you try to use those low $100 bills we gave you. <laughs> Girls, do not give them change for those $100 bills. <laughs> so, um, the last chapter in the book is also called The Doggy Bag. When I find things that I really think need to be said, or taught or whatever, but that doesn't quite fit into any other slide or any other chapter of the book, I create the doggy bags. It's kind of like going to a restaurant and you had a really good meal and there's a little bit left. Well, you take it home in a doggy bag. Here's your doggy bag. Okay, so alimony is no longer deductible, but it's also no longer income. I can't believe the government took this long to figure this one out. This was so obvious for so long. So it used to be if you paid alimony, you got to deduct it off of your income, but the person who got it had to claim it as income of their own. Who pays alimony? The person who makes more money or the person who makes less money? More money. So they're probably at a higher tax bracket, right? So they were, the government was letting them deduct it from the higher tax bracket and pay taxes on it at the lower tax bracket. They finally caught on going, we're losing like 10% taxes on all this money, let's just reverse that. We won't let them deduct it, they pay the taxes and the other person gets it tax-free. So, um, like I said, I can't believe it took them as many years as it took them to figure that one out. The sale of a home, it was uh, for quite a few years now, so long as you own the home for five years and live there for at least two years, you could walk away with up to a quarter million dollar gain, quarter million dollar gain for a single person or $500,000 for two people. Government caught on again. They figured out people who had like second homes and vacation homes, they'd move there for two years and call it their primary residence and then turn around, move back to the regular home, sell the vacation home, walk away with you know several hundred thousand dollars tax-free. Government decided we're putting a stop to that. We have now changed the laws to five out of eight years. So you have to have owned it for eight years and live there at least five out of those eight years. So they changed that one drastically. Another, that's another biggie that they basically took away. Medical deductions to count are back down to 7.5% of your income instead of your 10% of income. As you know, two years ago, they moved it up to 10% uh, for everybody under 65. This last year, they moved it to everybody. And now this year, 2018, they're taking it back down to the 7.5. But this is, once again, here we go giving ice cream to somebody who's lactose intolerant. It's not going to help most people because they've raised the standard deduction so much, they've taken away all the miscellaneous deductions, the chances of somebody actually using this to save money on taxes are slim, very, very slim. So it's another one of those, like I said, they're giving ice cream to somebody's lactose intolerance, something that will very seldom be used, if ever. The state taxes, <laughs> some more lactose. Um, <laughs> they moved it from $5 million to $10 million, and that's per person. I don't know that many people are worth over $5 million per person. I know almost an equal amount of people are worth 
$10 million per person. In other words, this is another one of those things that looks really good, but it's not going to help. I don't think it's going to help anybody in this room. Um, and, you know, the rich are going to get it. The people own the corporations, they're going to get to use it. They're basically going to get an extra $5 million to pass along to their heirs tax-free, which is good for them. But that just, at, you know, we're talking a 47% tax rate. So we just gave them an extra $2.5 million. So that's, that's the way pretty much the whole tax law is written. They give it, then they can weigh a little bit more than they've given it, especially when you put into um, the equation, the cost of the health insurance and what's going on with that in this country right now. So that is it. I do have, um, I want to say thank you to um, all the people who helped put this thing together. Michaela's doing our filming for us. Let's thank Michaela for doing that. The, this will be put on YouTube. And there's another way you could thank her, actually, and me at the same time. It's so right after this, she's going to be out in the hallway. So if a couple of you would like to be videotaped with comments about how good or poor this was, <laughs> uh, we'd, like to have, we'd like to have a couple of those recorded. We think that'd be pretty cool. Um, the two ladies who work for me, uh, Giovanna and Shauna, they're both hiding at the moment. I don't know where they went. Of course, they helped uh, put this whole thing together. A lot of you talked to either one of them. There's Gia. Shauna is still hiding. Uh, my wife, Valerie, of course. Holly Verostic, she's one of my daughter-in-laws. She was giving out the uh, ditty bags and uh, put those together so that you'd have something to ride on, which was very nice of her. And we thank you for that. And then the other sponsors were, I knew I should have brought that up here with me. Uh, Whitney Carlson, Carlson Chiropractic, she was helping promote this. Uh, Mark Chamberlain of Chamberlain Coins. Cindy Miller of Farmers Insurance. Marie Rains is here. She's here with Snifter's uh, Liquor. Probably still missing one. I did Holly. Did Colorado, Colorado Friendship is here and they were helping uh, helping uh, promote the event. And of course my office. <laughs> but so thank you very much for coming. I hope you found it to be worth your time. Like I said, if I'm not your accountant, please take these ideas to your accountant. Say, hey, how can we take advantage of this? We do offer consultations after May 1st. We're not taking new clients for taxes, but we do uh, consultations, it's 150 an hour. If you need somebody to help you figure out how to maximize these, we will do that after May 1st. So thank you very much for coming. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Five minutes for questions. Okay, when you're talking about the 35% to 21%, the corporation, is that for C-Corps only or is that for pass-through corporations as well? C-Corps only. The pass-throughs... Well, what about self taxes? No, self-employment taxes stay the same. All pass-throughs are that 20% deduction off of your income instead. Yeah, which an S-Corp is, a partnership is, even sole proprietors consider a pass-through. Depends. An LLC can be treated as a C-Corp, an S-Corp, or a sole proprietorship, or a partnership, a single member or multiple. So it depends on that classification. So if you are a sole proprietorship, definitely not. You have April 15th. C-Corps changed to April 15th. S-Corps are still March 15th. Partnerships are still March 15th. If an LLC is treated as a partnership, it's March 15th. If it's a single member partnership going inside a personal return, then it's back to April 15th. They've made that quite confusing. They changed that last year and I wish they hadn't. But yeah, thanks for the question. Any other questions? The charitable deductions, they changed slightly. <laughs> Here's some more lactose. Um, <laughs> intolerant. Instead of giving up to 50% of your income away for, to a charity, you can now give up to 60% of your income. So 
Not very many people want to give away 60% of their income. And you gotta remember, they took that standard deduction up to 24,000. So unless you have other things that are gonna add up to it, you'd have to give, if, let's say you had property taxes and charitable deductions, nothing else. Your house is paid off and all that. You'd have to give away like $25,000 to get any benefit because you're going to have to get over that $24,000 mark to, to really have any benefit. So if you can't give to charity, give to charity because you like the charity, not for a tax break. Unless you really have a lot of money, then I might become a charity. <laughs> Yes, you have to be your taxable income. So that's after your, your deduction, your standard deduction stuff. You still have to be under the $77,000 mark. But that's 80% of, of the households in America. But are you assuming that in the future you're going to make more money? Is that like for Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If I could get it for free now, what do I care what happens in the future, to tell the honest truth? I'm going to take advantage of it while it exists. Right, none, uh, zero. zero. Like I said, my record is I had one guy, we brought in $37,000 of capital gains and paid zero dollars in taxes because of that rule. It's big, it's big. If that rule didn't exist, that would have been $5,000 in taxes. So yeah, take it while it exists, take advantage of it. One more, if there is one more, if not, we're going to call it quits. Okay, we found one. <laughs> so, so for an employer, there is no downside to allow an employee to be in the statutory employee status? No. There is um, one kind of gray area. Like I said, they'll do the Social Security and Medicare, but they do not have to withhold for federal or state. So somebody who's, uh, the employer could choose not to do that, and then the person would have to make estimated taxes payments on their own. So that's the one little kind of downside, but considering what it would save them for the deductions they could get, it, it's an easy, easy one to put up with. So yeah, there's no downside to the employer. They could choose to or not to or whatever, but yeah, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. Actually, there's a bit of an upside. They may not have to pay unemployment insurance on you. So you might, I'll have to check that part. That just dawned on me when you asked that question. Yes, one last one, okay. Yes, yes. And even, now they haven't, I think they're gonna clear this one up a little bit because I kept looking for it and thinking, well, what if you use that home equity loan to build an addition onto your house? You know, but they're saying home equity loans, none. So that would mean, and this is bad news, that would mean in order to get that deduction, you'd have to redo your first loan. Home equity loan costs you a couple hundred dollars to do. To redo a first loan, you're talking five to $8,000. So it could cost a lot. It might not be worth grabbing that deduction. So, okay, we're gonna call it quits there. Inflation factors, social security, pensions. And I'll show you how that money's going to come out over the next 20 or 30 years and when you're going to run out of money or if you're going to run out of money. You're going to have a bunch left. We're trying to use what we put. We're trying to like. Hello, my name is Carolina. I provide psychotherapeutic services. I also do investigations for the district courts, mediation, and I have a vacation rental. So the presentation today was particularly helpful for me in terms of deciding how I want to manage not only those businesses and represent them in my taxes, but also what I want to do with regard to my own uh, retirement account, my stocks and bonds, and any other income that I might have. I'm very grateful for the presentation, and uh, thank you very much.